morning, my friends. Welcome back to another episode of Mastering Diagnostics. This is episode number 13. And I want to refer to this one as the importance of circuit load testing before committing to a repair. Let me tell you a little story. Years ago, I was at the dealership, at a Honda dealership, and a, and a good friend of mine, fellow technician, was working on a Honda minivan. It was a Honda Odyssey. And the van exhibited a crank condition without starting. Crank, 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 nothing. I'll fast forward, get you get to the punchline here. Um, the vehicle had an inoperative fuel pump. It, it wasn't working. So what the technician did to determine that it was indeed the pump, of course, he had no fuel pressure. And when he went back to determine if the circuit was healthy at the pump, here's what he did. He took the fuel pump connector and he unplugged it. And he put his voltmeter red lead in one side of the fuel pump connector terminal. And he took his voltmeter black lead and he put it in the other side of the fuel pump connector terminal. And he simply turned the key on, and his voltmeter read approximately 12 and a half volts. And of course, with 12 and a half volts present, the technician condemned the several hundred dollar fuel pump. Well, here's the problem he went up to the parts counter, he obtained a brand new Honda fuel pump, he put it in the vehicle, and he plugged it in. And to his surprise, crank, 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 crank. Of course, he said, it's not a problem. The system just has to prime. Crank, 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 crank again. It turns out he made a really big mistake. And here was his misconception. When he unplugged the connector and measured and saw available voltage and ground potential, meaning a 12 and a half volt difference, it told him that that circuit had everything it needed for that fuel pump to operate. But the way he was testing the circuit, was in open circuit. It wasn't performing any work. So here's what I'm getting at. I'm not going to tell you what fixed the car yet. We're going to learn that together. But I walked over and I told him to plug that fuel pump back in and we're going to retest. Except this time we tested at the back of the connector while that fuel pump was plugged in and the circuit was the, the circuit was connected as it was designed to function. This time when he turned the key on and that fuel pump circuit began to work, 12 and a half volt differential was not available across that fuel pump connector. It was far less than that. It was something like four volts, certainly not enough to allow that fuel pump to work as it was designed to work and deliver that quantity of fuel up to our fuel injectors. The end result was, I had located a problem in a fuse box. Now, we all have oversights and mistakes, and we need to learn from our mistakes. But the problem is he still didn't understand what he was doing wrong. And that's exactly what today's lesson is about in mastering diagnostics. So I put everything into a PowerPoint presentation because I just think it's easier for me to demonstrate what I'm trying to convey to all of you. Um, without having to switch back and forth unnecessarily between pictures. Now, I know many of you are probably rolling your eyes when you start hearing me talk about things like Ohm's Law because, right, we're automotive technicians. We're not physicists. Well, it turns out you're wrong there. We are, in fact, scientists, and physics is a huge part of our job, especially, especially as diagnosticians. So there's some electrical laws of physics that we should be familiar with. And when I say familiar, I don't mean I expect you to understand the written word. In other words, for you to regurgitate back to me what Ohm's law is by definition in paragraph format. All I really want you to remember is this little pie chart right here. V standing for voltage, A representing amperage, and R representing resistance. Voltage is electrical potential or pressure. Amperage is current flow, the flow of electrons. And resistance is the opposition to current flow. So the way this is drawn is how voltage, amperage, and resistance relate to one another. 
In other words, if we had a fixed resistance value and we increase current flow or amperage, there would be a difference in potential or voltage drop across that resistance. The more current flow we have across that resistance, the more voltage drop we are going to have across that resistance. If we had an increase in resistance, that would equate to a decrease in current flow, as long as voltage remained the same, right? Electrical pressure remained the same. Resistance would create a decrease in current flow. And of course, if we had a fixed resistance and we increased voltage, electrical pressure, current flow would increase. So I want you to keep this in mind as we progress forward. And I want you to take a moment in this video, heck, take a picture with your phone, print it out and hang it near your toolbox so you always have this available to stare at because it's really going to help you with every single vehicle you work on when facing any type of electrical fault. In case you're not comfortable with this or familiar with this, this is a lab scope capture. And what we are measuring here is current flow through a DC motor, a direct current motor. Now, in all fairness, this happens, this DC motor happens to be an engine starter motor. And we can get a clue by how high the amperage is here. Um, but regardless of what DC motor it is, this current waveform should function, should appear, excuse me, approximately the same. So I want to point something out here. When we turn on a DC motor, current for a moment increases drastically. Um, we call this inrush current. As the motor windings begin to saturate and build a magnetic field, that current, you can look at it as filling up, almost like filling up a bucket. It current is free to flow. But here's what happens that's, that's really nifty. As that DC motor builds a magnetic field and begins to turn, that magnetic field creates something called counter voltage. And we call it counter voltage because it opposes the current flowing into the winding that made it a magnet to begin with. What's my point? The counter voltage, again, opposing the current rushing in, is going to lower overall current through the motor. We can see we've gone from 530 amps down to maybe a fifth of that, around 100 amps, maybe a little more. And that's simply because the motor is spooled up or spinning. So what's my point? My point is this. Let's pretend you and I are going to be addressing a vehicle that suffers from a fuel pump that is inoperative. What I'm demonstrating here is a healthy fuel pump motor and circuit. So really quick, we start with a source voltage of approximately 6. Point, uh, tw excuse me, 12.66 volts, which yields us 100% fully charged battery. I just want to make sure you understand this has nothing to do with what we're talking about right now. We're just going to assume this battery is healthy. Battery voltage is supplied to our PCM and other, other circuits in the vehicle, but we're only concerned with this fuel pump circuit. That same battery voltage is going to be supplied to a relay. Now, the PCM's job is to energize that fuel pump relay, and it does so on the high side, the voltage side. This relay would be always grounded. So when the PCM outputs a voltage, the coil windings inside the relay become a magnet and cause this switch to latch, allowing battery voltage to flow current into the fuel pump, which in this drawing is always grounded. So what I'm measuring here with my voltmeter is the difference between the red voltmeter lead and the black voltmeter lead. That's how voltmeters work. The difference between the two shows almost full battery potential. And the reason why it will never be full potential is every connection we have, there will always be some voltage drop. That's totally normal. But my point is we have approximately full potential available to this fuel pump to allow it to operate at its best. This I have introduced a voltage drop, in this case, a resistor. And this resistor is designed to flow current, drop voltage, and at the same time, that voltage, that current, is transferred, uh, transferred into heat. That's what we're seeing here. That's what these smoke 
signals represent. So the circuit functions the same, except now we've added a resistance. I want you to now look at the difference in potential between the meter leads. There's an eight and a half volt potential, meaning this fuel pump that should be operating with electrical pressure of 12 and a half volts is now operating at 8.5 volts. So I have to ask you a question. Keep this in mind. What would happen to fuel pump speed if we now have eight and a half volts available to the fuel pump instead of 12? Think that through for a moment. Of course, the logical answer would be, Steckler, the fuel pump's going to slow down. And you'd be absolutely right. The eight and a half volts here is only eight and a half volts because the 12.6 volts, some of it was dropped across this resistance. So if we started with 12.66, we got, we lost four volts across this resistor that leaves approximately eight and a half volts, give or take, to this fuel pump. So I want to go back for a moment to this waveform. Our inrush current, again, is because the motor standing still and has to saturate, and it's the magnetic field that allows it to spin, and its speed creates counter voltage. The counter voltage lowers the current. So what would happen if the fuel pump motor were to slow down? We could cause damage to that fuel pump. So what am I getting at? In the situation where my good buddy at the Honda dealership measured the fuel pump and replaced it, measured voltage drop across the fuel pump, then, excuse me, measured available voltage and available ground at the fuel pump connector when the circuit was inactive. Had he, per, had he replaced that fuel pump, as he did, and, the, and it was lucky enough that the fuel pump worked. In other words, we didn't have a tremendous voltage drop like I measured, but he had a small enough one where the pump still worked. Because the voltage drop was there, the pump couldn't operate at full potential and could eventually fail prematurely again shortly thereafter, maybe in several weeks, sometimes in a couple of months. So I'm going to show you how to avoid that situation and why my friend encountered the problem he did. This is basically what he did. He pulled the fuel pump out of the circuit and instead introduced, in this case, I'm demonstrating it with a light bulb. He introduced a light bulb in place of the fuel pump. So considering this right now is a healthy circuit without a problem, it's plain to see that if we energize the circuit as it was designed to function and we substituted the load that the fuel pump is with the load that a light bulb is, of course, the incandescent light bulb here is going to glow nice and bright. Now, pay mind to what type of bulb this is and how much energy it uses, relatively speaking. Now I'm going to change the scenario up just a little bit. I'm going to add that resistance right back here again. Now I want to point something out here. First of all, I want you to take note of the brilliance of the bulb. Without a resistor in place. And with the resistor in place, there's virtually no change. The question is why? Well, why is this yielding only a 300 millivolt drop where with the fuel pump in place and functioning properly yielded a four volt drop? The answer goes right back to Ohm's law again. And here's my point. If I told you this fuel pump were to draw 10 amps of current flow and then I told you this light bulb only drew several dozen, maybe even a couple of hundred milliamps of current flow. It's plain to see that the loads are different because current is equivalent to load. The more current we have, the harder the circuit works, the harder the circuit load, the higher the circuit load is. So this would be a relatively high circuit load, and this is a small one. Because current Resistance and voltage drop all relate to one another, as I mentioned earlier. If we have less current flow, even at the same fixed resistance, 
we have less voltage drop. Meaning if we started with 12 and a half volts and we only lost 300 millivolts, we still have 12.2 volts to supply this light bulb with. 12.2 volts of electrical pressure. Of course, this little light bulb is going to function properly and it is not going to be indicative of a circuit fault like you see here. So I want to show you how to do this properly now. What we want to do is try to match the load that we have here with a replacement load of similar load value. Meaning if this draws 10 amps of current flow, we want to load the circuit with approximately 10 amps of current flow. And that will be indicated, excuse me, that will be indicated by the brilliance of the bulb. So if I were to substitute this bulb with a heavier light bulb, one that more closely matches the intended load, I will adequately stress this circuit and my bulb will show me the results of that test. Here's what I'm talking about. If I substituted a big, heavy, high beam sealed light bulb, the current flowing through this device more closely matches the current that would be flowing through the intended load, the fuel pump. As a result, look at our voltage drop now. Since we increase current flow through this bulb, the voltage drop is much more significant. And as a result, look at the brilliance of our bulb compared to our tiny light bulb. So I know, Steckler, what's your point? My point is this, how many of us use test lights, incandescent test lights to test circuits? I used to. How many of us use logic probes, a nice bright green or red LED? Very easy to see. I used to use those as well. But the problem is those require very, very, very little current flow to function. Meaning, if I use them to test circuit integrity, when they illuminate and glow brightly, as they tend to do, what is that telling me as the analyst of that test? It's telling me that the circuit appears to be healthy. And even if I know what I'm doing, bad information makes me make bad decisions, right? We're analysts, we're scientists. We make decisions based upon the data we collect. And if that data is insufficient or doesn't properly reflect the actual conditions of the circuit in this case that we're testing, we're going to make bad decisions. So what I'm getting at is we have to stress test these circuits to make sure they're functioning properly. In other words, going back to that same vehicle that my friend at the dealership was analyzing. 